Good Friday morning. Welcome inside Mr. Small's Theater in Millvale, Pennsylvania. This is Geik Scott Game on the River's Edge, coming to you every Friday as always. I'm your host, Matt Geika. You can find us at riversedgepgh.com. You can find us on Facebook Live as well. And, of course, in all the ways that podcasts are streamed these days, The River's Edge is there for you and proliferating our unique brand of Pittsburgh heavy sports talk. Well, not sports talk, Pittsburgh heavy talk and music, in fact, all over the world, all over, well, wherever you can find an internet connection, which uh, might be easier or might be harder for you in the future, depending on some legislation or some uh, <laughs> some machinations in our United States government. But that's neither here nor there this week, even though it is quite relevant to what we do here at River's Edge. The man to my left is Brian Crawford. No, I'm not going to talk politics. I don't really feel like it today. Well, maybe a little bit. We'll see how things go. But if you've listened to this show in the past, you know it is uncommon sports talk. I try to go off the reservation a little bit. I don't want to rehash all the same old tired storylines that you may have heard during the week, whether you listen to sports talk radio, you listen to podcasts, whatever you do, however you consume your sports, I'm trying to give you a little something different as your weekend begins. And what a significant weekend it appears to be in Pittsburgh sports because of the Steelers. And they're hosting the Patriots at Heinz Field at 4.30 on Sunday afternoon, not quite prime time, but it might as well be. They'll be on the big stage. Everyone around the NHL, NHL, NFL will be watching them. I'm in a hockey mode. We'll get to that in a little bit. But everyone around the, the sports world will be watching, really, at least as far as our country is concerned and our continent to people who care about pro football because it's the two best teams in the AFC. Yes, the NFC may have more contenders, but the AFC has these two traditional powerhouses in the Steelers and the Patriots. And even though the Pats lost last week, taking a little bit of the luster off this matchup, it still functions because the two teams are within one game of each other as probably the deciding factor in who has home field advantage throughout the American Football Conference playoffs. And as we've seen in the past for Steelers Patriots, Pittsburgh has a much better chance to pull off the victory at home. And not like there's been all these matchups and so many throughout the history of these two franchises, but to have that game at home, this team has been talking about it all year. And I'm thankful that we're finally at this date. We finally made it to the midpoint of December to week 14 of the NFL schedule, where the Steelers can play this game that they've been waiting for, that their fans have been waiting for. And even up in New England, I've been checking out some of the, the coverage of the Pats, the defending Super Bowl champions. And they've been looking forward to this one for a while, too. And maybe even the players were last week as they played Miami and put forth uh, one of their worst performances of the season, just their third loss. They have three losses. The Steelers have two. And like I said, as long as these two games were within one game and up near the top of the AFC standings, then it was most likely going to determine things. Because even if the, uh, the Patriots win... Uh, this one. They'll be tied with the Steelers, but they'll have the tie break. So uh, in a similar way on the Steelers end of it, if they win and they get a Jacksonville loss, they will have already locked up everything you can lock up in the NFL's regular season, which is pretty rare. With two games to go, and considering the way this team has played this year, they've had their hiccups. They've only had, what, one blowout win, that defeat of the Titans before Thanksgiving. Um I didn't see this coming for this team. I didn't think that they were going to be able to hang right near the top of the AFC. I thought they were going to be able to win the AFC North. Don't get me wrong. They locked that up last week with that thriller of a win on Sunday night against Baltimore. But that has felt like a given since about week four, week five, week six, somewhere in that range. And it has come to pass. Again, they are division champions, but there are eight division champions in the league. This team has higher standards, and with their offensive stars still in their primes, or in the case of Ben Roethlisberger, still good enough, obviously, as we saw last week, to be a difference maker, then uh, this looked like the opportunity. And with the defense coming along and developing and growing, that really seemed to be, uh, this really seemed to be the, the opportunity for this team to max out and to go forward and to to make the Super Bowl at the very least and make another run at championship number seven. But it's been really weird this season, partially because the Steelers haven't looked dominant in most of their wins. Um, even though if you look at one of my favorite metrics uh, put up by the folks at Football Outsiders, it's called 
Defense adjusted value over average, DVOA for short. It measures per play efficiency and uh, it gives a little bit more credit for uh, a third and six conversion as compared to uh, a seven yard pass on third and 10 that gets you nowhere. So it has some situational adjustments in it, which are necessary in the sport of football. If you watch the sport, you know the defenses tend to uh, allow a little bit more. They, they play toward the first down stick. So that is uh, one of the real benefits of this stat. It tells you more success rate per play as opposed to just yards per play. So it gives you some more context. The Steelers offense has been in the top 10, if not the top five all season long, and the defense has come along too. So you could just say they were perhaps unfortunate to not have some blowout wins, to not have some more impressive wins on their resume, despite uh, or on top of destroying Cincinnati at home earlier in the season in that game against the Titans that I mentioned. But um, they have been, they, they should have been better than they looked, is the way I'd put it. So it's been an odd season in that way. And w without this team really looking like it's rolling in the midst of these games, yes, they've won several in a row, but they've never looked like they've been rolling. So it's been a little weird. And then all of a sudden, you come to the end and you realize, oh, they can lock everything up in uh, the third to last game of the season. So you give them some credit in addition to taking away some credit, uh, you give them credit for winning these games, but you also take some away for not converting their dominance into points, into defensive stops as often as perhaps they should. But here we are in week 14, and they're right there. And it's been um, all about this matchup, it seems like, for, for Steelers fans, even when they were going through some struggles, even when they lost to the Bears, even when... They were destroyed by the Jaguars, and you thought maybe the Jags will be the best team in the AFC this year. Even all those things considered, the Pats matchup loomed because this is the last obstacle for the Steelers team. As we saw last year in the AFC Championship game, um, they still have some hurdles to climb when it comes to New England. And they're not alone in that fact. The Patriots have been the best team in this century in the NFL, and they've had some ups and downs, but their downs have been much less down than most teams. And... The Steelers are the same way. Uh, they, they certainly are in the regular season. No losing seasons under Mike Tomlin. But as for the playoffs, they've had this obstacle. And they haven't played the Patriots that often recently, just last year in the postseason. But this is the final boss, if you want to use a video game reference, which I will here. This is the guy they have to beat. This is King Koopa, if you want to go back to the Mario Brothers days. I just dated myself. I'm 32. Yeah, I played Super Mario Brothers. That was my favorite game back in... Oh, the early 90s on uh, Nintendo and Super Nintendo. This is what it feels like. You're working your way up. And even though this is a regular season game, to beat them in this spot when both teams are looking like they're prime contenders, you could argue it's just as important as any regular season game that the Steelers have played this decade. Can you think back to anything bigger? I, I really can't remember it. And like I said, they'll host it. They'll be on the, on the prime stage, if not in prime time. Mike Tomlin said this week that uh, the kitchen will be at Heinz Field, and it's good to be in the kitchen. I'm not really sure what that meant besides maybe it's getting hot, it's heating up. <laughs> well, Mike has his own verbiage at times, which I enjoy. He, he can lean away from the traditional coaching cliches, which is pretty good. He makes up his own, so I'll give him credit for that. Uh, but I got what he meant. Uh, all the focus is on this game, and... I'm still left wondering how significant it is because do I think even if the Steelers lost this game and they had to go up to New England, assuming all things go well from this point forward, and play the Patriots in Foxborough in the AFC Championship game, could they beat them? Uh, yeah, I think so. So it does make me question how important it really is. Is this game more symbolic than anything else? Um, and, and have the Steelers already accomplished um, a big deal, a great deal? I think they have in getting to this point and putting themselves in this position. So I would advise fans, not that I'm telling you what to do, but I would advise you to enjoy it, to uh, look forward to it. And I hope we get a good matchup. I hope it goes down to the fourth quarter. And uh, we see these teams go toe to toe, which has actually seldom happened in the, the history of this all time series. Typically one team or the other has it locked up. Last year in Foxborough was the Patriots taking command. Um, and remember the Pats also came in and beat the Steelers in uh, in the regular season last year. But that was weird. That was Landry Jones in the game instead of Ben Roethlisberger. I don't know what you do with that one. There have been a couple of games in this series, in fact, between these two uh, that have had the backup quarterback in. Landry last year. You saw Matt Castle back in 08. That's when the Steelers went up there and blew them out. So you take those two off the board. 
we really haven't had that real toe-to-toe game. You go back to the early part of this century, 01, the Patriots unexpectedly ran away with it with some special teams touchdowns and uh, a Drew Bledsoe cameo against Cordell Stewart and the Steelers. And then in 04, it was a complete blowout in the AFC title game at Heinz Field. That was Ben Roethlisberger's rookie year. The Steelers were 15-1. and They were favored, and they got crushed by Tom Brady and the Pats. Maybe the best Pats team that we have seen. So um, just the, uh, the spectacle of it, for the spectacle of it, I would love to see the, uh, these two offenses especially go head-to-head. Head. And with the Steelers' defense trending downhill um, last week was, I think, discouraging for them. It was a mediocre Baltimore offense. And yeah, they don't have Ryan Shazier. That, that's going to be the fact of the matter the rest of the year. And we'll see how Ryan recovers from the spinal cord stabilization surgery that he underwent earlier, um, or pardon me, almost two weeks ago at this point. So, um, you know, that's it's almost tough to talk about football in that sense, but it has affected them. That might have been the player they could least afford to lose. So I'm looking at a high-scoring close game, as I wrote on DK Pittsburgh Sports this week, because both offenses have been in the top five pretty much all season long. The Patriots offense, arguably the best in the NFL. They'll get Rob Gronkowski back. So uh, it'll be modern football, won't it? in that way and whether we're talking about run or pass I think these two teams will um, have their way with each other's defenses and if it does come down to the end um, and if it is a close game I don't know if we really learn anything about who's better than whom and of course the playoffs it changes everything maybe these teams hold something back schematically as well that's what you have to uh, factor in so I don't want to call this week insignificant but I think it's more symbolic Maybe even more so for the fans, and especially for the fans of the Steelers who have developed a really potent inferiority complex when it comes to the Patriots. Uh, this will be an old-fashioned, you know, underdog at home type feel, even though I'm not sure what the actual gambling line is. Uh, it might even be the Steelers are favored here in this one. Maybe some of you out there will be able to fill me in. I can check that at the break. Uh, however, as, as far as regular season games go, this could be... Um, as good as it gets without anything really tangible um, in a division or as far as making or missing the playoffs on the line. Yes, home field is important. I don't know if it's the end-all, be-all, but hey, like I said at the start, the Steelers themselves have been discussing it and wanting to beat the Patriots to stop being their little brother. Mike Tomlin brought up the Patriots three weeks ago in a press conference, getting away from the old coach speak and the one-week-at-a-time mantra that you hear so often in sports. He admitted it. I thought it was pretty healthy for him to say that because his team has been talking about the Pats forever. So could you argue the Pats are in the Steelers' heads? Maybe a little bit, especially from the fan perspective, the Pats are in the Steelers' uh, supporters' heads. So um, the atmosphere at Heinz Field will also be intriguing. If the Steelers fall behind by a little bit, will the fans stick with them? There's a lot to watch. There's a lot to watch uh, coming up on Sunday. So um, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I haven't been the biggest NFL fan in recent years. I watch it more because I feel I should be informed on our nation's most popular sports league. But in this case, yeah, I'm looking forward to all that go goes along with the the hype and the pageantry of the NFL. It should be a good one. I hope it is, at least, for everyone here in town's sake, uh, because you've been looking forward to it all year, and that's the, the benefit of it, because you get that excitement, but it's also the drawback of it. If it doesn't match up to your expectations, then it feels like a real letdown. I hope the show hasn't been a real letdown for you so far on the River's Edge, coming to you from Millvale and Mr. Small's Theater, historic Mr. Small's Theater. I'm Matt Geica. He's Brian Crawford. When we come back, I'll be joined on the phone lines by my good buddy, Alan Saunders. We're going to talk about the Penguins. Do they need a big change, or is it enough to just ride it out and give this core group one last opportunity perhaps here to uh, to go for a Stanley Cup and to go for that third consecutive Stanley Cup which has been proven to be incredibly elusive in this league over the past 3 decades this is the river's edge <laughs> Hey folks, it's Mike Sasson of The Mike Sasson Show. Me and Alex, my producer extraordinaire, looked at the landscape of internet radio and figured if we want to make it, we've got to work. At least an hour earlier. Now on at 9 a.m. every Tuesday on The River's Edge, a new kind of radio. Welcome back inside Mr. Small's Theater up on the hill in Millvale, Pennsylvania. I am Matt Geica. 
and you are listening to Geek Scott Game, or you're watching Geek Scott Game, coming to you every Friday from 10 to 11 a.m. If you're on Facebook Live, our Facebook Live page always active there, or if you're on our website too, you can find the video stream at riversedgepgh.com slash live. And thank you again for accessing the show, no matter how you may doing it, may be doing it. Our guest at this time is sometimes a fill-in host on Geek Scott Game, which is weird because the show is named after me. I always feel bad for him because it's like Geek Scott Game featuring <laughs> Alan Saunders. Alan's got game too, and that's why I bring him on board here. He's a man of all sports. We'll talk a little football. We'll talk a little hockey as well. We'll get into the, the Penguins chatter. Don't worry about that. But, Alan, let's start with the Steelers, and good morning, sir. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? Going to be with you again, whether it be over the phone or in person. I know I've been seeing you around. We saw you down at uh, RMU Penn State last weekend at PPG Paints Arena. Penn State picking up the win there. But here we look uh, forward to this weekend, and uh, with the Penguins out west, and, well, the, the game against the Vegas Golden Knights, of course, had its own appeal to everyone. But um, at this stage of the game, the Steelers are in a more significant portion of their schedule. So we'll go into Steelers' pats here. And as I said in the opening statement for today's show, it almost feels like it's it's more symbolic than anything, this game against the Patriots, because no matter who wins, no matter who gets home field advantage, it's looking like these two teams are, are once again on a trajectory toward each other in the playoffs. Maybe the Jaguars will have something to say about it. We'll see how the postseason goes. But... Um, what do you think the significance of this game is at Heinz Field? Is it more of a uh, of a confidence boost uh, than anything if the Steelers can get the win? Yeah, I think it's a it's a confidence boost for the Steelers if they can get a win. And on the other hand, you know, the New England offense hasn't played particularly. The defense hasn't played particularly well. They're not in like you know if you mentioned the Penguins. We're talking about the Penguins right now, like. Well, they just won two Stanley Cups, but they're not really playing that well right now. And there's mm-hmm. some things going on. I feel like if you talk to some Patriots fans that have about the same same <laughs> mindset, maybe despite the record, like, yeah, you know, probably going to get the number one seed coming off <laughs> Super Bowl. But, you know, just that was, you know, bad game against Miami. Didn't play all that well against Buffalo. And then if the same thing happens against Pittsburgh, a playoff team, I think maybe – I mean, Bill Belichick's not the kind of person that's going to panic ever, but I, I would think that uh, people would start to ask some questions about, man, is this is this New England team as dominant as we thought? Uh, are they just a very good playoff team this year? Uh, what's the difference between this team and, and last year's team? So I, I think it's interesting in that it's it's kind of rare to have two teams with a record as good as these two teams have play one another this late in the year and the game yep. don't really mean that much. <laughs> it's really like the That's team what I was that saying, loses yeah. is, is not gonna like feel uh, despair. I mean, God, I mean the Steelers fans burn the town down every time they lose. But probably, uh, <laughs> like I just don't. I don't feel. I, I feel like this game has an inevitable. Re- you know, it's like a boxing title match where you you know no matter who wins or loses. There will be a rematch, right? Um, and <laughs> so I think that sort of takes away from, like, if this game had happened in October and both teams were were on this trajectory, I think people would have said, "Oh, this is a really big, you know, early season game and really important. To see where these guys." I think we know what, what these teams are all about. New England is really good, but maybe not quite as good as they've been. Uh, the Steelers are great in spurts, but kind of inconsistent. Seem to find a way to win some games late. I don't know that we're going to change our greater opinion of these teams based on what happens this week. Yeah, it feels like more hype than substance this week, but I'm okay with that. I am looking forward to seeing it late in the in the regular season. Like you said, these two teams right at the top of the conference. And again, apologies to the Jaguars, but it does have that uh, it does have that feel all season long that we're going to see an AFC Championship rematch, whether it be here in Pittsburgh. Or up in Massachusetts. Now, let's go into the hockey, of course. That's uh, what I love to talk to you most about. So, um, the Penguins last night, they lose their fourth and five games, 2-1 to one, to Marc-Andre Fleury and the Vegas Golden Knights. Seemed like a fun atmosphere out there. A lot of Penguins fans made the trip, or they're already out there, in fact, and they showed up in their black and gold. But uh, all that 
symbolism aside, of course, there was some of that involved in uh, in that matchup too. Um, uh, but as for this team and where they are right now, um, what's the main problem for the Penguins? Because it's weird to me to look at their five-on-five scoring issues because they haven't been a terrible possession team uh, since the first couple of weeks of the season. They've had the puck. They get a lot of shots. They get a lot of shots on goal. Um, they get their share of scoring chances. I'm not sure if they're great scoring chances all the time, but with the caliber of shooters that they have on this club, um, they, they shouldn't be the worst shooting team in terms of percentage in the NHL at 5-on-5. Five five. It's crazy to me to think about that. So I, I suppose I'll, I'll angle it that way. Do you think that it's just a matter of time, or now we're 30-plus games into the season, maybe it's not just bad luck. They're doing something wrong to be shooting at such a low percentage and not getting much of anything from their offense at even strength. Well, I think when you think about a team that is having a low shooting percentage and you see skilled players, I think the thing to me is, well, what's a really high percentage shot? And those are the ones from in front of the net, rebounds with traffic, Mm -hmm. and they're ones where you get the defense out of position. And I think the thing that I haven't seen is they haven't been able to have those really dominant offensive zone shifts where they just possess the puck, seems like forever and ever and ever. And you can't have those without the defense being really active and really involved in the play. Like three guys can't pin an entire team in their zone for 30 or 40 seconds, but five guys can Mm -hmm. if they move the puck well. And so we're not seeing that. And and I don't think we're seeing enough guys uh, going to the front of the net with purpose um, to capitalize on – those, I mean, that's those, those are the. If you want to have a really good shooting percentage, shoot from the blue paint. Um, <laughs> Easier you know, said than done, but yes, correct. Yeah, I mean that's 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 where they're going to go in, and I think there's a bit of a perimeter uh, to their game, maybe more so than we've seen in the past. Mm-hmm. I think some of that's natural, just when you look at the the changeover in the in the roster, and I mean if you look at the top nine wingers i guess if you include Hagelin in, in that top nine i'm, I'm not sure he played he might have played on the fourth line last night but uh i think he played with shea and so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll consider him okay well if, line, if you yeah. consider Hagelin on the top nine i mean outside of hornquist that's the the other five wingers there are, are mostly perimeter guys i mean brian rust will stick his nose in there but he's not particularly big and and he his his assets are speed and more so than just plugging up the front of the net. And, and I don't think you need a big guy to do that either. I just think it's about a commitment to playing a more difficult style. And, you know, these guys, I, how, how could you criticize these guys that have played back to back full seasons all the way through to the Stanley cup final. Oh, and, and a few of them played in the, the World Cup of Hockey, the off season before, yep. so they're going on essentially like six straight seasons of hockey. I, I don't know. I just don't think it's very realistic to see Stanley Cup winning effort mm-hmm. eighty-two times a year. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't think they have big problems. If if I was Jim Rutherford, I, I think I would turn to some young guys. I, I like uh, Dominic Simone. I, I think there's a couple other yeah. guys in Wilkesbury that have skills that will transfer to the NHL. I don't know if they're going to be well-rounded guys. I, Daniel Sprung is one that, that everyone knows. Um, the, uh, the the young center, um, Adam Johnson, you know, really good skater. Um, it, it, there, are, there are things down down there, the pieces that you can say, well, that's an NHL talent. That's an NHL talent. Zach Aston Reese, obviously, is a bigger body if you're looking for someone to go to the front of the net. Uh, and the Penguins have had so much success with bringing guys up mm-hmm. and plugging them into big roles and seeing what happens. Guys like Gensel and Rust and Sheary. And so I think that'd be crazy not to not to try some of those guys and see what happens. Maybe that's the move here because you look at you look at where they are, and I did this little thought experiment this week. Okay, who would I trade if I wanted to make a, a big move, a significant move to bring in someone to either help their forward depth or if you're of the mind that they need more help on D, and you brought that up that maybe the D aren't helping out enough in the offensive zone, then who do you trade? Is it a Connor Sherry who has what? He just signed a three-year contract extension over the summer. 
and um, he's one of those perimeter type guys that you mentioned. Um, I don't know if you can move Carl Hagelin. He's still due four million next year after this season, and it looks like his productivity has uh, really hit a, a brick wall over the past 100 regular season games or so. And then you look at the defense. If you trade, say, just throwing this out there, like a Brian Dumoulin or an Ole Mata, maybe they're a little redundant with those two guys. Um, then you need to bring someone in to help the D because I don't know if you're willing to go into the playoffs with Chad Ruido as your sixth man, no offense to him, but um, suddenly you're looking really thin at the defensive side. So maybe the answer is what you're talking about, just going from inside the organization and uh, saying, hey, kids, come on up, take uh, take your opportunity here. And like you mentioned with Dominic Simone, I think he fits in well, uh, maybe even in a top six role because he plays that give and go game so well. So after two straight Stanley Cups, perhaps that's the, the most prudent move when you're right up against the salary cap. And I think if you look, like you kind of touched on it there, like the places that the team could trade away from, well, I think the place that the team could trade away from is is fast wingers. Right. right? And yep. they've, they've got a lot of those. And that also happens to be what they have in wilkes mm -hmm. So if you bring a guy up like Daniel Sprong and, oh, all of a sudden he's he looks like an NHL player, then – then maybe trading Connor Sherry or, uh, you know, Carl Hagelin or Brian Rust then seems a lot more realistic um, as opposed to, well, yeah, it's, it's fine to say we'll trade Connor Sherry for defense, but then who plays right wing on the first line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could just be a youthful injection that the Penguins need at this point of the season. Um, where do you stand on, what do you think about Tristan Jari's performance? Do you think... The Penguins are, are solid now. They don't have to go out and get a goaltender to help with uh, with with Matt Murray help carry the load the rest of the way. I think I've always sort of felt that Matt Murray is not going to be the kind of goaltender that's going to routinely play sixty games a year. Okay. Um, well, he's never done so, it in his life. So no, he's never done thing. it. And <laughs> still young, but he hasn't done it. Yeah. And so I think that sort of changes the math a little bit. I don't think teams – I think teams would typically shy away from taking a 22-year-old and saying, you're the backup. But I think if you figure, okay, it's already December 15th and you're going to get another 15 games, 20 games, I think that's a that's enough of the year to say, okay, it's it's worth everyone's time to have him around. And then, of course, he's got to play well enough to maintain that role, and I think so far he has. Uh, so, yeah, I think the Penguins would probably be served well to treat Matt Murray with, with some kid gloves and and give Tristan Jari um, maybe a bigger opportunity than the typical backup goaltender. And I think he's played well enough to deserve that. Uh, 919 safe percentage is, uh, you know, certainly nothing to shake a stick at. Mm -hmm. And... So I, I, I think, I think that's one of those problems that just solved itself. I, I don't see backup goaltenders being a, a top burner issue right now. Yeah, me neither. I'm thinking into the future. Do the Penguins have a true tandem situation? Maybe I'm a big fan of Jari's talent, and I, I think he brings a little extra uh, game-changing ability because the Penguins weren't playing that well defensively in front of him, and I thought he kept them in some games. It wasn't just the backup goalie um, treading water, and it wasn't the case of a team rallying around a backup goalie and playing more cautious. I didn't see that at all from the Penguins either, so he did quite well in a difficult situation where it pretty much had to be him. No offense to Casey DeSmith. One last thing on the Pens, and then I'll let you go, Alan. Are you ready to give up on the Ryan Reeves experiment? Is it just time to cut bait and say it's just not going to fit, whether it be in the modern NHL, you, you can't have a, a line like that with maybe he and Tom Kuhnhockel or even Carter Rowney. Are they too slow to, to keep up? Or is it just a Penguins thing? Maybe they just don't fit in with the identity of the team and you have to have four quick lines to play the way they want to play and have that type of, of attrition and that constant threat on the ice. It's like... You remember when you were a kid, you played with Legos, right? And you oh, got yeah. the Legos set. Absolutely. And like, <laughs> this, is, this is like, I don't know, a Fortress in the Woods set, right? And, you, you, <laughs> you know, everything's in browns and greens and grays. And you're, you're building your little castle. And then, and then I'll and see, I had a sister. And then you've got one pink Barbie Lego in there oh. because you didn't have all the right pieces. You, you lost the piece to your, 
to your uh, your fortress in the woods. So to me, Ryan Reeves is is the pink Barbie Lego <laughs> and, and the Penguins fortress in that he just doesn't fit with the rest of what they're trying to do. He's not a bad player. He'll make all the little connections with all the rest of the Legos. You could build an NHL team where I think Ryan Reeves is a perfectly reasonable contributor. I just don't think the Penguins have ever really, and certainly not under Mike Sullivan, have been a team where he's going to fit. I thought when they signed him, maybe it was a sign they were going to sort of change the way they wanted that fourth line to play, but then they haven't. I mean, they've essentially been been the same. So I think it's one or the other. You've either got to find a way to make him fit in a line that's just going to be an energy line that's going to play seven minutes. Let's go out there and hit people and and get back on the bench. Or he, they, they've got to play somebody else. I, I don't see how they can continue uh, doing what they're doing and and putting him out there. And really, to me, is it's sort of an unfair position for him because I don't really think yeah. that that he's been put in a position where he's able to succeed with his skill set. And it's not like he was a player. He's a young player. He was a player that's been in the league for a while. It was no mystery what he does and what he brings to the table. And so it's it, to me, I think it's a little bit unfair to, to criticize him personally. Mm-hmm. I just think he's not going to become something that he isn't. They either need to find a way to make that fit or move on. Yeah, he is what he is. And he was playing over 10 minutes a night for the Blues at the end of last season. So clearly Mike Yo and, and St. Louis felt like he fit in with their scheme. It's funny, you said you can build an NHL team that can use Ryan Reeves' skill set. I think that team might have been the Blues, <laughs> uh, his yeah. former team. And he ends up here in Pittsburgh and... Um, He's playing sometimes four and five minutes a night uh, because he doesn't kill penalties. You wouldn't want him out there killing penalties, first of all. But he doesn't kill penalties, and he's not a not a power play guy, obviously. And the the fourth line, you can just tell from the usage by Mike Sullivan. He's going first line, second line, third line, first line, second line, third line, maybe mix in the fourth because he doesn't – I don't think he feels like that they're competitive or he doesn't feel like they, they fit in with what they're trying to do. Yeah, and I think that the down – grade in in the bottom six centers have sort of made g- given him less options mm-hmm. uh, also it, 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 he only has so many things he can do there and there, there's no there's no individual goal scoring talent um you know so it almost has to be uh kind of like the penalty killers just get thrown together on a line because there's nowhere mm-hmm. else to put them yeah. and then when it's ryan reeves with the penalty killers that's just not a line that's going to do a lot for you at five on five. Uh, if you have the penalty killers with Matt Cullen, all of a sudden that becomes a bit of a different dynamic, I think. Or, or if they were able to move Riley Shea down to the fourth line, you know, okay, maybe maybe like a Hagelin Shea and Reeves fourth line mm-hmm. fits together really well. Uh, but but I just don't think with Carter Rowney, he, he's not going to provide the kind of offense, the kind of foot speed to have a bigger, slower guy on his wing. It's just not going to work. Yeah, you got to go get the puck first before you can do all those uh, well, energy-creating things that you were just talking about and and holding on to the puck down low, playing heavy, playing sticky, as they talk about in the dressing room. Thanks, Alan. Always appreciate your perspective. I know I can go multiple sports with you, so that's uh, part of the reason why I enjoy bringing you aboard. And uh, tell the folks where they can find your work. You're all over the Internet, as always. Yeah, um, well, at a Saunders underscore PGH is where you can find me on Twitter. Um, Pittsburgh Hockey Digest, uh, www.berghockey.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I pit stuff at Pittsburgh Sports Now, Pirates for Pirates Prospects, <laughs> and all over the world for the Associated Press. There you have it. Maybe they'll send you to Pyeongchang, South Korea. I, I'll sign up for that. <laughs> I would too. Hey, experience a different culture and. Uh, the Olympics would be a big check mark in my career if I could tick off that box to, uh, to yeah. use a little bit of British slang. Yeah, I would love to love to make it happen. Maybe less feasible this time around. We can bring it to this continent, and I suppose we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, let's let's make it happen. Let's <laughs> let's go cover the Olympics together. Someday. Let's do it, Matt and Allen at the Olympics. That would uh, unleash us on handball, or if it were the Winter Games, uh, curling and. Uh, what else is out there? Nordic skiing. We could try our hand in a whole bunch of 
of things. I could write about anything once. That, that's the one thing I, I would love to, uh, to, to diversify in that way. That's Alan Saunders. I am Matt Geica. Thank you for listening to Geica's Got Game on the River's Edge. Back with more in just a little bit. Hi, I'm Rob Spear, host of Damn Near Killed Him, an interview show where anything goes. Once they gave it to me, you could have stuck a telephone pole up my ass. I was about to be, like, kicked out of the country. <laughs> That's where they send the worst of the worst. And a psych ward. It, it, like, normal things seem so weird in there. He was making $5,000 a month doing gay audiobooks. Hear some stories from people who have been to the edge and back Thursday morning at 9 a.m. on riversedgepgh.com or download on iTunes. I mean, that's, like, some pretty cool shit. More local music on the river's edge. I am Matt Geica. I will not be playing local music, and that's a good thing for you, believe me. I'm one of these guys who got a guitar. In fact, for my 18th birthday, I got a, a Fender Stratocaster. And I said, I'm going to play this. I'm going to learn how to do it. Got all the, um, the, the tabs. They'd call them online. You could find them. I'm sure they're everywhere now. Back in the day, it was like, oh, there are a couple of guitar tab websites you'd go to to learn how to play certain parts of songs. And as happens in life, you get busy, you get different interests, and uh, that guitar is still in my basement. I still have the amp down there, too, Brian Crawford. So, have you ever played any music? Or are you ever into uh, that? Yeah, so I used to play the trumpet, actually, when I was in high school. The and, trumpet? Uh, wow, yeah. that's kind of non-traditional. I like, or Actually, it is traditional, but not like what you would think of, uh, of yeah. a young person's instrument. Well, you know, I was, no I was given the, uh, the choice. I said I could either uh, you get the trumpet or I could play the drums, and those were the two instruments that I was actually interested in performing. But uh, yeah, I recently played the trumpet, actually. Uh, at For the what? At one of the open mics. It was at Hambones. Really? And oh, actually, man. no, it wasn't at an open mic. It was at Zhuzh, which is a variety show that they do at Hambones. And I was selected to tell stories, and I told a story about a time where I was at a veterans event with Tim Murphy, the now disgraced congressman. Yes, Tim and Murphy. And I embarrassed him <laughs> with my rendition of Taps. So, <laughs> it's pretty fantastic. Uh, a, a, an inverse tribute, if you will. Hambones, a good friend of mine uh, named Greg Afek, grew up in, in Steubenville, Ohio, across the river from where I came up in, in Weirton, West Virginia. Uh -huh. He has performed at Hambones frequently. He's kind of a you know one man singer songwriter type. Yeah, I think I'm friends with him on Facebook. You actually. probably are. Yeah. I think we, you've connected with him. He is performing the national anthem at the New Orleans Bowl. Oh, really? He won some sort of a Facebook contest. So oh, very cool. I hope that whichever of the ESPN family of networks is broadcasting that, I hope they give us a at least a glimpse of Greg's anthem. They probably won't, considering it's not one of the big games. They typically just go right to the start of the, yeah. the action there, but. Good for Greg, good for Hambones, which is, uh, again, much like this place where we're broadcasting from, uh, Mr. Small's Theater, a real legendary spot in uh, in Pittsburgh. Nightlife, Pittsburgh Entertainment. Um, they have open mics there quite a bit, don't they? They do, every Tuesday. Yeah. yeah, it's a great open mic on Tuesday. And actually, uh, this entire, I feel like this entire segment is going to be a plug for Hambones, but the, <laughs> the day before Go Christmas Eve, yeah. The day before Christmas Eve, I will be hosting Zhuzh, actually, and, and New Year's Eve, not Christmas Eve, really? New Year's Eve, yeah. And New Year's Eve is my favorite holiday, so it'll be a, a fun time. How do you spell Zhuzh? Z-H-O-O-Z-H. -O -O -Z my goodness, I'm going to have to look that one up. Yeah. Okay, uh, I like that. Anyway, uh, Brian, I wanted the, the real business I wanted to get to you yes. <laughs> with here before we run out of time. Net neutrality. Um, the FCC basically going away from net neutrality this week. And it was only established in 2015 some guidelines to basically make Internet service more like a utility, like water, like electricity, like gas. Uh, so you couldn't have tiers. You couldn't have, um, I guess, the Internet service providers limiting access to people who don't pay more to get, like, the higher package. Um, how does that affect your business here, um, here at the station at, at River's Edge, do you think that of, ever comes into play? Yeah, I think it's kind of terrifying. I think as we grow, you could see companies like iHeartMedia or CBS or any of these other large industries who have a lot of capital trying to quash us by paying for faster speeds or paying to throttle our service or mm. anything like that. And I yeah, that see, is scary. Yeah, I could see that also, uh, you know, with DK Pittsburgh Sports, you could see that with maybe uh, a major sports production coming in and, mm -hmm. and trying to, to do the same thing. It, to me, it's terrifying. And it's, it's just... It's pretty horrible because the, the one nice thing about the internet is it was a, like a bastion of, of real free speech and you could really... There were very, very little limitations mm -hmm. on... 
on on the internet, which I thought was great. Uh, now, of course, there, there's some negative to that too. You get the fake news and stuff like that, but uh, the positive is, is it was a, a place to really express yourself, and uh, this kind of limits that to some degree. So we, well, we look forward to seeing. We don't, maybe we don't look forward to it in a, in a positive way, but we we do want to see how this all develops out. And I figure you'd have an opinion on that. Do you have an opinion on this? When you have teams like the Steelers, like the Penguins, um, well, the Penguins have won back-to-back championships, but the Steelers have been looking forward to this Patriots game all year, like I talked about in the opening segment. Does that take some of the joy away from the regular season? Personally, I kind of miss the days when um, it was like the young Penguins team trying to prove themselves. Uh It it feels like for me, as someone who's trying to craft a a storyline or a narrative, it's harder to find those, and I think for fans it's harder to get more into these games because you've seen them go all the way to the Cup Final and you realize, well, these aren't the most important games of the year. But at a certain extent, when you start to lose like the Penguins are now, then that does bring the urgency back into the regular season. So maybe losing a little bit can actually increase the excitement. That's my I, thought on I that. I think you're right. I think it does make it exciting. I think when you saw, you know, the Penguins and they, you know, when they had Johnston and they were mm-hmm. crap in the bed and they almost and, missed the playoffs. Yeah, Three it was exciting ago. to see yeah. them turn it around and and have that race and, and make it, you know. Mm-hmm. Just making it into the playoffs seemed exciting, let alone yeah. winning the Stanley Cup. You know, it's all about expectations, right, and what you get used to. Sure. And I think it's healthy to have sports franchises that have a little bit of, of, of oscillation because, say in the case of the Steelers, if they had a 6-10 and 10 season or threw in a losing year, um, I think that would actually, uh, well, not that Steelers fans need any reason to, to get fired up or to get pissed off about their team, but um, I think that would actually make them appreciate more seasons like this one where you're grinding out all these close wins and um, – Maybe I'm guilty of this, too. I had high expectations for the Steelers team. I thought they were going to be dominant in most games or in a lot of games. I know that's maybe unfeasible Mm -hmm. in the NFL, but I thought they would look better. I thought they would perform better overall than just squeaking by some of these teams. Um, But uh, in the end, when when you look at the wins and losses, they've done about as well as you could expect. So um, maybe it is uh, the, the curse of the winner, right? When all of a sudden, regular season success isn't good enough. Close wins aren't good enough. You're always just pushing that bar upward and upward. Yeah, uh, that's true. I I kind of expected them to do better myself. I, they've had some some interesting injuries and stuff like that this year, though. So. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. right. They, they've had, um, well, with, with Ryan Shazier, that one might be the biggest one yeah. for them. And that might really uh, actually curtail their ability to limit a team like the Patriots, who has an elite offense. Um, but like I said, I'm expecting a lot of points this weekend. I'm expecting, um, even though, as as Alan concurred with me there too, I don't know how much this game actually means, uh, but it is fun to see the two top dogs or two of the top dogs go at it. And that's what that's what sports is all about. When you have a winning team, you want to test yourself against the best. I think you? it means more to us than it does to them. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, when you're the when you're the defending champions. Well, not only that, I mean, how many times have they crushed us? You know, or, or maybe not crushed us, but beaten us? Uh, yeah, in some yeah. big games this century. That that's what I think has contributed to this inferiority complex for Steelers fans with the Patriots because Tom Brady has been going at it for like a generation now. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking, this is his 17th season. So um, in the world of sports where things change in a hurry, you don't often get that type of longevity. So he's been a, a super villain. So is Bill Belichick, those yeah. two together. And of course, with all the Patriots, um, you know, run-ins with the NFL in terms of, of cheating with Spygate. I don't know what really happened with the deflation of the footballs, if that's legit or not. But there is that that reputation. They wear the black hat very well, don't the Patriots? Oh, yeah. I mean, Bill <laughs> Belichick doesn't do anything to, to thwart the image that they have. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't give That they hand. have been given, yeah. <laughs> so, in fact, I think he enjoys it. Oh, yeah. I find Bill Belichick to be a very compelling character because he doesn't give you anything personality-wise. You can tell he's just about football and... There's something for me about a guy who doesn't care about how he's perceived that is attractive. Maybe because I always care about how I'm perceived, and that's like something I'm super sensitive about. Uh-huh. So I'm envious of that of that ability. Do you feel like that way uh, too sometimes? Because um, with the shows you do, you're in you're in the public eye as well. Um, I almost envy the, or I do envy the people who can just say, ah, oh, screw it, I'm just going to go out there and and do my thing, and I don't care what people think about it. Yeah, I mean, I kind of run with that a little bit on my show. Mm-hmm. I, I do care on some aspects. I, I care what you know local 
people in the local scene think of me and things like that, but I don't really care what the general public thinks. You know, sometimes it's fun to have people who don't like you. So Well, yeah, that can stir up something, too. Uh, any press is good press, right? I yeah. Think, uh, that has proven to be the case in, in some situations. Now, not if you're trying to be someone that you're not. If you're trying to be inauthentic and yeah. being a troll, I think there's – a difference there, but if you actually think something and it's unpopular, then so be it. That's just. However, it is fun to troll are. people sometimes. Like uh, the one day on Facebook, <laughs> I, I. You're not pushed, opposed to it. Yeah, but. well, I, I put out a demand to raise property taxes just because I knew all the property owners would get up in arms, and, and I was <laughs> right. They did. It and worked. That was, that was fun. So, but I really didn't feel that passionately about property taxes either way. You know, it's just. Fun. Oh, okay. You you were just doing the. Uh... Well, the, but, the but, rabble-rousing thing. But we were talking about shameless promotion, and I was talking about the hand bones segment, and, and I would, if I could, uh, put out one more plug here. Uh, you yeah, mentioned go for net it. neutrality, January 21st, which is a Sunday, uh, the Acoustic Brunch. I'll be hosting that, and we are going to be raising money to whoever. We, we're not sure yet. I'm, I'm more talking with the ACLU to find out which organization to support, but we're going to find a, an organization that is taking up a lawsuit against the federal government in regards to net neutrality. And we're going to be using that brunch to raise money for whatever organization okay. that is. But it, I am working with the ACLU to find out who that organization is. So it's not just some someone I found on, on the internet. Okay. <laughs> That's a good idea there. Yeah. Did you see all the fake comments, the fake petitions that were posted on the, the FCC's website? Um, makes you wonder who's out there trying to pull the strings and make this net neutrality thing go away. Um, Comcast, Verizon. Yeah, which, I mean, which already... nefarious actors could be out there? Yeah. Um, so not that I want to see American businesses fail, but big businesses and small businesses need to get along, right? And it's better for competition. It's better for you, the consumer, if some of the smaller ones can succeed as opposed to the big conglomerates. And again here, Brian, we see news this week. What was it? Um, Disney buys a stake in 21st yeah. Century Fox. It's like the monolith, the media monolith just grows narrower and narrower. And, and I don't think that's good for anybody. When do personally. antitrust laws come into place? And when do, when that's do they, what I wonder, yeah. right? I don't when know do enough start? about it, I suppose, to really comment on it coherently well, here. Well, apparently but. if you own a news network that the president doesn't like, then all of a sudden oh. it becomes an issue. But other than that... Well, that's what All's you have to worry game. about, too, right? Because the current administration has control over the FCC. You can appoint heads and chairs in those situations, too. The current so. administration is run by someone who has the mental equivalent of a, of a elementary schooler. And I'm not talking about his intellect, just his his, his attitude. Maybe emotional his intelligence. Emo yeah, the, I mean, way people like it. to say he's stupid. You can't run. You can't become a billionaire. And I don't care no, that. No. I, I understand that his dad gave him a loan. <laughs> but you know what? It takes some sort of an intellect to turn money into more money. Most people lose money when they when they get it. So I'm not going to say he's stupid, but I am going to say you're maybe the, an emotional in intellect of a child. I would agree with that. <laughs> well, this one took a turn, huh? I don't think we've ever talked about national politics on this program. It's, hey, it's whatever. Somewhat of a sport, you know. <laughs> it is. Well, you know what? I was thinking about that this week. Politics and sports. You have the final score in politics. That's the vote count. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you also have. On both sides of – well, it's becoming more and more like a sport in the way that you have one team against the other. I don't like that so much. Um, I would I would rather have it be more of a diversified and maybe more of a, well, I'm going to vote with this team on one issue and this team on another issue. But so be it. Politics and sports are really converging. When I watch political coverage, I, I see so many of the sports cliches used. Yeah. I've killed quite a few cliches on this show, but you <laughs> hear terms like horse race. Um, you know, crunch time. All, it's so funny how they cross over. And I find that many of the political commentators like, well, Tim Russert, God rest his soul, uh, your Chuck Todds, um, th they tend to be big sports fans too because I think they uh, enjoy the competition and handicapping it, if you will. There's another yeah. sports term um, as well. So, yeah, you can treat it like that, but also these are real issues. And as we discussed with the FCC and net neutrality, um, uh, yeah, it's fun to say. Well, you know, this this team did better to sell their um, to sell their platform, but I these only, have real implications. I only wish the FCC was divided as the Republicans in the Senate. <laughs> uh, yeah, there there are well, <laughs> there are factions, and um, like you see with sports teams, sometimes the locker room gets a little bit upset, and that's what we're seeing right now. I think yeah. with the GOP. Anyway, thanks to Brian Crawford for both chiming in in this final segment on Geek Scott Game and. Producing the show, that's the real hard work here. 
I'm just talking in front of a mic. They turn this thing on and uh, wind me up and let me go for an hour every Friday from 10 to 11 here on the River's Edge. Look at our festive set, by the way. I'll be back in one more pre-Christmas show. Uh, and by the way, this was show number 100. I didn't make a big deal about it on the River's Edge, but the century mark has been attained. I think I've hosted all but three of the shows. I was looking back at it, and I've appeared on all but one of the shows. So thank you so much for tuning in, whether it be on Facebook Live recently or uh, back when it was just the the, uh, the audio stream as well. It's been a great time. Um, it's been awesome to uh, communicate with you and have more of a free-flowing platform here rather than uh, just straight up sports, 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 sports. It's good to, to mix it up and and take a, a wider view of things. Anyway, I'll be back in the studio next week here at uh, Mr. Small's Theater in Millvale, Pennsylvania. This is Matt Geiker reminding you that when the radio fades, you know life's moving fast. Have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you on the other side.